Right. Now, I'm really hoping that everything is going to connect okay, because that adapter can at times be a little bit temperamental. So, please don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, may, may I give you a suggestion? Yes, please. All suggestions, it. welcome. I would try to plug everything oh, into the same power cord extender. Because, you know, just in case if you have two different power lines and there's any kind of... How do you mean? You know, just... It's a MacBook. It's only got one, like, one input, an HDMI-C. <laughs> no, I mean, no, 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 the mains power. The mains power. Just to have everything connected. But the mains power has to go into the adapter. Yeah. Adapter and everything should be connected to the same uh, okay. extension gate. Otherwise, okay. if you have two phases coming into this room, by chance. Why does it keep going to that input? That's not an input. That's the default. That's the default. That's the default image. <coughs> okay. Please don't tell me we've got to run a lead to the projector again. Okay, so we're now working. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Technical issue. It's almost a flipping technology, which is so ironic because it's an IoT meetup. <laughs> that has not gone up, gone unnoticed. I might add. A few of my friends on Facebook said, uh, "Your meetups are a little bit low oh, tech. Yeah. <laughs> you should have everything kind of gesture controlled and motion sensors and scan your yeah, yeah. retina as you walk into the room and everything seamless. And you got a the chat bot running the events instead of a human being. That would be awesome." <laughs> Quite looking forward to uh, the day that Tim gets replaced by AI. It's going to happen at some point. I'm kidding. I did tell him that on the way here. Um, we are one lady short, as uh, some of the regulars may have noticed. Emma McLean is. Uh, she's not on vacation. She's um, or she's uh, in Spain anyway. Armor um, at a wedding, I think. I believe. So that's why we're kind of one woman, one one person down. Right, is this going to work? <laughs> You've got your clicker. I've got the clicker. Fingers crossed. Let's see. Does so, Leah, are you with uh, Urban Tide now? Because I wasn't quite sure. Yeah, so uh, tonight I'm representing uh, Urban Tide and sort of speaking on behalf of Urban Tide and then inviting you to collaborate with Urban Tide. So that'll come later. Um, that's one of the hats I wear, and that's the hat I'm wearing tonight. Uh, as a community manager for Urban Tide, but you can connect with me personally as well. Uh, the, there's my contact details, and again at the end. Um, so either way, that's fine. Leah, over to you. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you. Um, I'm slightly terrified. This is all going to. Yeah, yeah. But if not, it's fine. We'll just power on. Um, so I'm Leah Lockhart, and I'm sort of low key community manager for Urban Tide. Um, and what that means is. I try to build an online sort of tribe and community around uh, Urban Tide, and I'll explain what Urban Tide does in a minute. I'll just carry on. <laughs> um, so what I want to talk about tonight is engagement and how we can engage more people in communities, citizens, businesses, politicians, policymakers in this open data agenda and the work that goes on around open data projects, and then by extension, smart cities and by further extension, Internet of Things. So how can we involve people and foster understanding around all this work that we try to do with technology? Um, so this is me. Um, I have a long history in government and local government, um, digital projects and digital communication. Um, I started off at Edinburgh Council and then latterly was uh, with Scottish Government and until December was in Scottish Government's digital engagement team. And that's a sort of experimental team working with policymakers to encourage them to use the internet and social media to connect with citizens uh, and stakeholders in better ways so that more people can inform policy and make it more sort of democratically legitimate. Um, I am technologist and academic adjacent. I am neither of those things, but I work with academics um, and with uh, technologists. And my main goal in everything I do, in voluntary work and paid work, is to bridge disciplines and, and people. So how do we connect communities with scientists, academics, and people working in technology so that we're all collaborating and creating things together? 
Um, and Urban Tide is a, a small startup based at Codebase. And they're in the business of open data and smart cities. So smart city consultations, mainly at the moment, um, helping cities sort of figure out where they are and the, the, the smart maturity model. Um, we also deliver open data training to all public services on behalf of Scottish government. And we're about six months into that 12 month program. If you visit our blog, you can get a kind of six month update to see where we are and what the feedback's been and hopefully where we'll go after the program's done because um, there's more to do after working with people to get the basics about open data out there and, and, and in the organizations. There's a lot more to do after that. Um, and we're also building an open data platform called USmart. Um, if anybody here wants to know anything about that, I'm going to see the prototype for the first time Thursday. So we're going to start communicating about that more and more uh, from this week, hopefully. OK. Um, so I want to put out some provocations. I also want to ask a lot of questions, none of which I have answers to. And then I want to know if you'd like to collaborate to find answers to questions that I will ask. Um, I want to go over some case studies. So um, how sort of typical engagement is happening at the moment around open data in, um, in mainly government projects. Um, but I don't think they're atypical in private sector either. Um, so a provocation is that we have responsibilities to foster understanding um, in non-technical communities in the development of open, smart, and IoT agendas. Um, and that current engagement practices are really just producing um, really pretty artifacts. Uh, they're tick box exercises, window dressings. Um, and good news stories. So how can we go beyond that and move to open data 2.0? How can we move forward on a journey of engagement that's more meaningful, more impactful, <coughs> and will help us create things that are useful and usable? I want to put forward the idea of creating a five-star engagement uh, system, not unlike five-star open data. Um, and think about how, how do we make engagement core business to the work that we do? And why does this matter? Um, when you're thinking about working with data, open data, and communicating to people why that's important, and again, by extension, smart cities and IoT, how can we create things and um, work with people in ways that are legitimate? and democratically legitimate, and that fosters trust, understanding, and involvement, which in turn fosters discovery, serendipity. And even if you are sort of financially, commercially motivated, and maybe the civic uh, partnership is not your whole agenda, it's still good business to work with people, to co-create and to collaborate, because you know you're going toward creating something that's useful and usable. Um, so I'm going to put forward some case studies and talk about things that are happening now, sort of typical engagement practices, but thinking about it uh, as a journey. So what's happening now isn't bad or terrible or useless. I think it's just a starting point, and I'd like to talk about how we can further develop that and get to a place where there's something like a, maybe a five-star framework. So in my field of work, when talking to people about engagement and civic engagement, there's some rather unfortunate uh, things that come to mind. Uh, this is a recent example, uh, Bodie McBoatface. Um, when I was working in government, local government, a lot of the pushback I would get about uh, civic engagement, citizen engagement, was uh, we won't be able to handle the feedback, or you know, we're going to get all the crazies coming forward, or ideas that we can't implement or, or really do anything about. One answer to that question, or, or to a way to counter that concern, is that 
deeper engagement with people, so not asking superficial questions or doing a tick box, tick box exercise, will likely get you into a more involved and mature conversation with people that is meaningful and gets information back to you that was useful in product and service development. So just like uh, Mr. James Wilson said here at the sort of inquiry in Parliament, if you ask a superficial low state question, you'll get a trivial answer and you may get more interesting response from deeper engagement. So the engagement exercise itself, if it's built in and it's core business, is likely to have a more impactful um, way about it that will bring you back more meaningful information to your work. Um, so I just want to quickly talk about um, Future City Glasgow's future mapping project it was a huge piece of work, community mapping, and they were using analog and digital maps going into communities. Um, such a wonderful piece of engagement that created a wonderful, beautiful report, but it was temporary. It was treated as projects sort of hanging off the side of the Future Cities project. Um, you can see here the numbers, the engagement, the resource that went into this was immense. It was incredible. And they did help people in communities understand the power of mapping, how to use digital maps, how to use OpenStreetMap, um, and then handed over tools that they could take forward and do, carry on the work themselves, which is probably not happening. So one of, one of their own recommendations, sorry, this is what not to do on PowerPoint, but it's a good quote. Um, one of their own recommendations is that this, should, this type of activity in this community mapping and enabling people to understand and assisting them to do the work is necessary as a long-term thing. Again, it should be core business for it to continue. At some point, people will take that from communities and continue on. But to drop in, do something temporarily and come out again is nice, it's useful to a point. But if it's not core business, it'll probably die away. <laughs> um, when I was working in Scottish government, we implemented something called Dialogue, and it's an ideation platform. So it's a place where people can submit ideas around um, certain pieces of policy, um, either being redesigned or something that's being created. Um, citizens can register to the platform. They can then submit ideas. Other people can come in. They can vote. They can comment. And the hope is that the, there's a conversation inside the platform that goes back into the business of government and informs the way policy is created and, and molded and shaped. This is one example of um, some digital engagement that I was asked to help with, with regard to Agenda for Cities. It was a dialogue that was set up by a woman who was asked to do something digital, digital engagement. So she came to us, we set up this dialogue uh, that for a month and a half, sat with, with, with no outreach, no engagement, and no work to bring people to this thing. It was seen as being published online was it. That was good enough. It was visible. And if you build it, they will come, which didn't exactly happen. Um, so this arguably quite important um, discussion point, Agenda for Cities, um, had 18 contributions in just over a month and a half of being open to the public. Um, people in my own circles who are very interested in this had no idea it even existed. So it was step one put online, step two didn't happen, which was the outreach and engagement. So again, I think it's a journey. We're kind of getting there at the moment. We're doing things like going into communities and helping them map. We're doing things like putting stuff online, but we're not doing the extra bit that's actually encouraging people to come and co-create and collaborate. And that's not to throw shade at Scottish government. This is sort of typical that the engagement piece is, is extra. It's seen as, as something you do if you have time or, um, or it's done at the last minute. So how can we level up? Um, how can we go a bit beyond 
just putting something online or temporarily engaging with citizens and communities. And I want to put forward two examples that I think are doing really, really good work and are taking this engagement piece a bit further in that they're bringing uh, ongoing engagement into the core business of, of what they do. Interestingly, they're both uh, supported by housing associations and none of them are in Scotland. Um, so the first one is the Trafford Innovation and Intelligence Lab. Um, they do a lot of things with data to solve problems in the community around Trafford. Um, they're working out loud, they're working in the open. If you, do, if you visit their website, you can see what they're doing with data um, that is really impacting people's lives in the community. So as an example, um, the cervical screening in their area was falling through the, through the floor. Um, they did some beautiful things with data. They now have the most, um, <laughs> most uh, improved cervical screening going on in their area. And it was about using data to identify um, where the gaps were in take up. Um, some of the issues were around language and then some of the issues were around outreach. So they took the data and then did something in communities to engage people for cervical screening. <coughs> Thanks, Alan. Um, and that work is ongoing. So it's not project-based. It's something that's core business to Trafford. Um, and the other one is Bromford Lab. Again, a housing association. Uh, Bromford is doing uh, stuff in their innovation lab that is really less about the wider community and more about what can they do to improve the services they provide through the housing association. So they take something that's really gnarly and ugly and sticky for them as a problem or an issue they need to tackle. They give it a set amount of time to find a solution and if they don't, they drop it and they move on. They also work out loud. Um, so you can see them all collaborating on Trello, for example. You can see their thought process and where they're going. Um, and they, they publish everything that they do for everyone else to learn from. So again, it's core business. This lab is part of the Housing Association. Um, and it's using collaboration, innovative ways of working, and data as well to solve problems. Um, so if this is a journey and we're all kind of getting there and doing things to involve people continuously, what is a destination? Um, so I hope everyone's familiar with the uh, five-star open data, uh, five-star deployment scheme. I want to introduce the idea that we could do something similar for engagement with regard to open data. Um, a gentleman at Ghent University has come up with a similar idea for open data portals. So he's created sort of criteria at which he'd be one, two, three, four, five star. So could we do the same for engagement? What kind of five star, what does five star engagement look like? What does one, two, three, four, and five star engagement look like? Can we create a suite of things that mean people can sort of measure where they're at when they're doing open data work? not just regard to opening the data, but everything around it as well. So that's blank because I don't know what this might look like or even if it's a good idea. So this is why I was uh, putting it out to everyone here. And I have been speaking to other people about this. Um, I have a friend who is working out of University of West of Scotland, who's an ethnographer. She works in community digital media. So she's quite interested in getting involved in, in creating something around this. <coughs> so this is really a shout out to feeding back whether it's a crap idea. And if you think it's a goer, do you want to help think about what this five-star engagement might look like? And that's ways that you can get in touch.
Um, you're not sticking around for the Q&A afterwards. Do you want to do a Q&A now? Yeah, that'd be really good. Yeah, and then you can, uh, you can head off because I know you've got... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got uh, plans. So contact details here. Please follow Leah on Twitter. I've just been liking and retweeting and whatnot. So, and also the hashtag is IOTEDI and uh, at IOTDI and you might have noticed we went through a branding ex rebranding exercise. It was IOT Edinburgh, but now it's just IOTEDI just to save you a few extra digits. Questions? Does anyone have a question? There you go. Hi, Leah, I loved your talk. Thank you. Uh, By the way, you you oh, well, the group, uh, so My name's Sir Random. I come from Edinburgh Hat Lab and I'm active in my community, which is the old town of Edinburgh, which you're probably familiar with. Yep. I've been an Edinburgh person. So the first level of democracy, engagement, and community is your community council. As your community council, don't put out information. How do you find out what's happening in your area? Mm -hmm. The community council has access to area data sets in its local community. These are produced by kind of uh, actualizers, like kind of, uh, or uh, actuaries. Yeah, for the council. So each kind of a street or whatever is a data set. There's data for occupancy, uh, types of employment, the rest of it. All that information is available. Mm -hmm. uh, there is ossification in the council process. Uh, say you want to find out a licensing decision. You will not get a copy of the minutes of the licensing board. So there's uh, kind of, uh, barriers mm -hmm. type of thing. So first point is kind of, where do you engage? You engage for your local kind of, uh, community council or other body, depending on that, different types of things. Uh, building data sets. Kind of, uh, Data sets kind of, can be difficult because if people are not willing to get good data, mm -hmm. how do you work from them? And the Boating Mac boat phase was a good example of that. Because the Boating Mac boat phase was like a, 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 top, a reaction to top down processing. Mm -hmm. kind of, everybody knew that this question was going to come down mm -hmm. and you make the choice and it was a Boating Mac boat phase. Uh, kind of, I've done the phone in Scotland with uh, Hurricane Bob Yeah. Kind of, everybody understands what these are about. These are not trivial. Kind of, uh, answers to the problems that you're, you're citing earlier. Mm -hmm. These are actually people disenfranchised mm -hmm. and disheartened and disengaged from the system. Yeah. And these are the responses that make nationally very different thought out as a big body in my book base that supports it. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of, um, I've been asked, kind of, uh, for example, to do a data thing in Edinburgh. There's the Meadows uh, kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, Fair mm -hmm. Festival on Friday. Uh, the organizer of it was to do a uh, kind of open map of the stalls and be able to kind of, see when the stalls are occupied. Kind of, uh, when kind of, they're being booked and when they're being paid for. Mm -hmm. So this will be done with open mapping, graphic design, and uh, kind of, um, front and back end kind of, uh, designs. So I'm putting a small team together for that. Nice. So it's a wonderful project. But that thing could be rolled out for any public event. A street stall, a jumble sale, mm -hmm. that type of thing. So that's, kind of, that's a work in progress. Uh, again, I want to come back to the top down processing. Yep. Uh, kind of, uh, we have the community councils, we have councils, we have uh, kind of, uh, local government. There are different forms of engagement, different levels, up yep. that tier, the hierarchy of things. Uh, so, kind of, uh, top-down processing and kind of, uh, innovative ideas are not going to work if they don't fit what's there on the ground. Mm -hmm. You've got to work with it. So, not only are there kind of, uh, community councils, there's uh, kind of, uh, a neighborhood partnership, partnership schemes. So, you have neighborhood, neighborhood partnership schemes mm -hmm. where kind of, uh, a lot of disbursement of monies mm -hmm. or kind of, uh, road works, uh, street works. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dropping the payments, say for disability, kind of access for uh, kind of, uh, wheelchairs and uh, kind of, uh, buggies, and it's what your tap and games might be about. Mm -hmm. What is the end goal in making kind of, uh, these kind of, uh, open maps and kind of, allowing this data to go out? It's to improve, I believe, all our lives. Mm -hmm. And some of the most kind of common concerns of life are very mundane. Where the rubbish being picked up, kind of, if we know that kind of, uh, uh, kind of events going on in local areas, mm -hmm. so we can make plans to be out that night, or something like that. So. That's just a few ideas that I like. How do you incentivize people? Do you think it should be financial reward? Should it be peer pressure? How do you actually get people to respond? And Communication. Engage? Communication. Talking, engaging. Mm -hmm. if, uh, That's a skill ideas. though. A lot of, yeah, that is a skill to get the right people to, to be able to put out the right message, isn't it? It's, it's well, it is a skill and there needs, to, there needs to be a desire there on, on the organization side as well to engage. And I suppose I was putting Bodie McBoatface out as an example because it will haunt my professional life because people I'm trying to persuade in government, for example, that doing citizen engagement is, is good and it's useful will probably roll out Bodie McBoatface for the rest of my life. And it's, it's, you're right, it is legitimate because these are disenfranchised people or people who want to make a noise for a different reason. But it's also probably going to be used as yet another example of why citizen engagement is a hassle, or it's, it's not really worth doing. It's also quite funny at the end of the day. 
So it wasn't really, I didn't think that a spiteful intent no. to necessarily screw up the system sure. in an archaic kind of um, anarchistic way. I think just people, ju I know, I did, I just jumped on it. <laughs> Flipping fantastic! It just put a smile on my face. Mm -hmm. It was great. I think the uh, one of the other things though is that. Thank you, Randall. You're welcome. The council council council's council's been, by Glasgow have got to find 125 million. Mm. So uh, Glasgow's got a big uh, incentive for doing that, and uh, mm. I'm involved in another project in Glasgow. Which is a bit Can more you share your name? And uh, I'm, 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 I'm name. Bob Dryder. I'm uh, chairman of a few software companies, and. Right. Um, and one of the things we're trying to do there is just improve, frankly, just sorting out the rubbish and the collecting the rubbish that's actually exists within people's so You do that, you're going to be an absolute hero. Mm. I mean, all well, the are they trying to put sensors on the bins so you well, can tell whether they need it, to be... Sensors on the bins is quite easy to do, if you okay. want, and that's quite easy to do. But, but are they doing it? Uh, they are doing it. They are doing it. Yeah, you can measure okay. whether the bins fill, full or nearly full right. associated with that. You can measure... You can put tracking devices on the uh, on the, the if you like the pickup the vans that are going around. Make sure that they're not going over 20 miles an hour. Really, so if they do that, you can stop the you can stop. There's lots of things taking place that are actually going to be saving people's lives. What's your involvement, Bob? Are you actually working on some deploying some yeah, of these I'm, projects? Yeah, I'm doing software for them. This is in Glasgow. In Glasgow, yeah. Right. Absolutely. Right. So you're really kind of getting down and dirty in terms of some of the complexities oh, of deploying these smart, smart city. Mm -hmm. Well, you're, you're dealing with refuse, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll be That's interesting to you, see. Right? <laughs> it'll be interesting to see the communication around that, so it, just at a broadcasting level. So, you know, press releases or ads or whatever goes out through, through councils, but also if there's any engagement on the back of that. So helping people understand why this is good and it's useful and it will make things more efficient time-wise, money-wise, whatever it might be, I'm sure we all have a memory of another project that went on down south about sensors on bins. And the cry was that we're, we're being um, watched, it's surveillance, uh, that sort of thing. So to, to counter that and to make a more productive conversation will mean that engagement and communication needs to be thought about from the beginning, which it usually isn't. So I'll be interested to see how that works. Sorry to jump in. Particularly, I mean, that sort of boringly sexy kind of industrial IoT stuff, which is completely transforming the public, potential to transform the public sector and industry. And um, you know, they're quoting 50 billion devices. It's probably going to be more like 20 to 30 billion devices, um, uh, connected devices on the planet by 2020. If you extrapolate the, uh, the savings in terms of emissions and mm -hmm. uh, efficiencies and mm -hmm. the contributions made to the global economy, it's absolutely spectacular. And so many, so often I'm getting approached by people saying, okay, I've heard all about the potential and the hype. Show me some real life case studies. Mm. So if you can actually share what you, know, you are experiencing in terms of deploying these projects and what kind of, uh, you know, there is some quote, quoting that it can, but just putting uh, sensors on, on equipment can reduce your operational and management expenses by up to 30%. I mean, that's, well, Huge. Is that conceivable? A couple of, couple of projects, just, just, these are real projects. These are, this isn't theory. Mm -hmm. right. uh, we're doing uh, like food provenance, trying to make sure that the food, when it goes through the cycle, uh, it, like it won't get into America because Obama has put a certain legislative uh, control within that. That's one, that's one extreme. Uh, you go to outfits like Coca-Cola. I mean, this, this has been adopted. This is mainstream big technology, uh, so what they'll do is they'll go along to a freezer or a fridge, they'll put a sensor onto that fridge, we, we do it, and what right. happens is we'll measure whether the door opens, we'll measure the temperature that's taking place within, within the fridge, and we'll be sending that data up, and then we'll be doing pre predictive analytics, I don't know if you're doing that, so in other words, when you actually see a problem or can forecast a problem, you, you create a, a reaction. To, to actually is this predictive maintenance infrastructure <coughs> yeah, like so see, see the so you can measure, see we're measuring the, yeah. the the battery or the okay. uh, power level and say the battery is going down yeah we actually rather than let it go down and have to send out uh, an engineer to do that yeah. we get there and we create a predictive activity yes now yeah. coca-cola have got something like 10 million devices across the uh, across the world 10 million 
So you can imagine the amount of sensors that's in mm. there and the amount of data that's happening and the interpretation. That is big data and that is the Internet of Things. In the uh, industrial, maybe not industrial in the community right. world. Mm. That's yeah, absolutely. Really. That's where really the quiet revolution, I think, is really. But it would help to start Just talking about the industrial well, side yeah. because then people What's over time um, will understand it. From Hack Lab and, uh, are you from Hack Lab too? Are you? Yeah, as well. Oh, great. I, you know, it's great that we've got two you know, hardcore proper makers going out to cities actually making stuff rather than you know, the theoretical or the, uh, the more the sort of data stuff you're actually making, can I potentially make yeah. connected devices. So. Yeah, I, I wanted to talk about the, you know, engagement and uh, making people to actually engage with you know for whatever system it is and uh, uh, I recently was in Russia and uh, I found that in order to use a free uh, internet on metro on, on, on subway you actually need to go into your e-government profile and then in Russia in Russia which actually engages you into using all other services on your e-government profile, such as you know if you see some you know hole in the road, you make a photo, it comes uh, then to, you know immediately you know uh, uh, you know to the the site you know immediately receives all the information about where it is actually you know uh, happens and uh, what the problem is, and so uh, there is a whole number of uh, tools associated with your e-government profile, such mm -hmm. as example you can uh, talk to your local uh, MP well, you know, they, they call different in, in, in Russia. Things are very different. Yeah, but, but you can you can actually you can actually uh, book an appointment, uh, electronic appointment with your MP and you can actually you know be, talk to them yeah. through, yeah. through the program. I hear this is Estonia. Mm -hmm. is one of the most sort of wired countries mm -hmm. in the world for pretty much everything now. Is connected and paperless and electronic. Mm -hmm. You can set up a business on your phone in three minutes. Yeah, and that's one of many examples of, mm. of what they've they've, they've been uh, deploying out there. Can I just one quick point? Of course. Uh, one of the useful things to do is as talk about through the councils at the base layer. Yeah. It's help them get up websites. Really, yeah, so, out websites so that can actually communicate there's a lot of work happening out of Napier actually around that exact thing. So, um, and Dr. Bruce Ryan, if anybody wants to look up his work, it's been going on for a couple of years, um, looking at Scottish community councils, um, how they communicate or don't communicate online, and then sort of figuring out well, what would it take to help them get to that point? Because I, I, I get it and I understand community councils should be the first port of call for people wanting to get involved in their communities. However, if you look at the state of community councils at the moment and the resources they don't have, it's really, really difficult to, to make that connection to people in communities. And, and people in communities are going elsewhere, they're doing their, their own things, and these things are not coming together. Um, I'm a little bit worried about the, the fate of community councils, to be honest. It probably would be a good idea to make a collaborative project with a number of uh, councils across the whole country, because you know, mm -hmm. the services provided are pretty much uh, easy from yeah, well, there is there there is a kind of umbrella uh, group at Scottish government that brings all community councils together, and they do come together physically to talk about these problems. But when you go back to home pays, you still don't have money, you still don't have digital skills, you still don't have a website. So, so it's a resource issue and it's a digital literacy issue as well. Can I, can I talk about engagement? Yeah, Just let's do it. Because I mean, this is a. I'm not a geek myself, uh -huh. one of the most of the country geeks. Well, I don't believe it. Uh, <laughs> Do you write code? Uh, what? Do you I, actually I, write I was code? A, I was an IBM mainframe programmer, uh, and <laughs> using, using COBOL with PL1. COBOL, you're uh, kidding me, yeah, back in the day. Well, wow. um, Old school. So I've, done, I've, done, I've, done, I've done a lot in terms of programming, <laughs> but in terms of the uh, community engagement mm -hmm. side, I mean, uh, we run a, an information services company, and guess what? We print stuff out for people, oh. and the size of the, the print market today, although people denigrate it, is nine billion pounds mm -hmm. a year within the UK. Fifteen billion if you actually include uh, newspapers mm -hmm. in that particular market. Killing all those poor trees. Killing, all, killing all the poor trees. But yeah. actually, if you're like, it's part of an engagement strategy. Sometimes people don't want high tech. Sometimes they just want something. In fact, you're going to be excluding. 
you could big Russia, you could section of society them. that yeah. age or access to technology. Oh, I agree with that. So yeah, you've actually good, got to point, well, take into account the fact that there's an age demographic that actually might appreciate something a bit more simple and a bit yes. more... Uh, I have a family <laughs> member who still uses AOL email and he still <laughs> uses chatbooks to pay for things. But I won't mention who that person is. And they don't know what Facebook is. But yeah, I mean, you know, being flippant a little bit, there are people who are just being completely excluded well, because well, they don't have well, access to My wife to likes to read a book. She doesn't necessarily mm. want to read it. And so, well, and I think yeah, sort of print um, magazines especially and, and getting back to books is kind of coming back the way where even younger people are getting back into the analog. Yeah, and vinyls. Back. Yeah. <laughs> but I think this is where engagement being core business to a project is really important because if you do that, you then look at who you're trying to speak to. Who is your audience and who are you trying to engage from that point, you can better plan for the ways that you might communicate with them. Is it print? Is it face-to-face -face in the community hall? Or is it mostly digital? If you can't work that out, you're being inefficient, you probably will do a pretty poor engagement piece. So building it in core from the beginning means that you can analyze your audience and think, right, what do we have to put in place? And definitely, I agree. I think those of us who are digital, uh, communication practitioners don't always do well to say this is about augmenting. It's not about replacing the mail, the email, the print, whatever it might be. It's building on what you have in place already. I'm just uh, communicating with Tim, who's waiting in the foyer. The food is going to be 10 minutes late. So oh. apologies for that, but it is on its way. They can find a place. Um, we have a question. What, just introduce yourself to the group. Um, Andrew Smith. I, I, I saw Andrew Smith. Andrew Smith. At the beginning of the sort of the digital era way back in. Sorry, what is it Andrew? Yep. Andrew Smith. Yep. And what do you do? Uh, I'm retired now, but I, my, my career was designing and developing systems. Excellent. It started off when. Sort of a system architect? Or yes. Right, okay. It started when things like the networking didn't exist. Uh -huh. So this is pre internet of things. I'm yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, one question I had you know, regarding data and the way that things need to evolve, in that newspapers were created to do things like publish official notices, and even today many people buy n newspapers like the Scotsman mm -hmm. for the hatches, matches and dispatches, mm -hmm. and the other thing that's in there are things like, um, like road closures and changes to road details, but how could I get that detail out of Johnson Press or from some other source to actually get it online? So that it's available as a as a PDF, so I can develop. Isn't that Google's job? PDF? Isn't Google's uh, mission statement to digitise all the world's information? It's actually already published. All that information you're after is published in a uh, online Where's website it? called the Gazette. The Gazette. If you public, if you Google the Edinburgh Gazette, and uh, there's an Edinburgh Gazette, London Gazette, Belfast Gazette. But why isn't Andrew aware of that? This is the thing. You know, we're talking about all this information being siloed. No one knows it's there. It's not readily accessible. You know, it takes someone like you to say it. it's already there. It's it's gatekeeper. Why did you know this? Gatekeeper. Why is that? That's and a control it, issue, yeah, right? Then Knowledge is power. London is, a, is the official reporting of royal events, royal births, death, and marriages, and also who's hoarding this information? What is their agenda? Why are they doing it? Where's the taxpayer? We're paying for That's that information true. to be shared and codified. We spent a lot of money. I used to work for. Uh, I worked Sorry, what's your name? My name's Elliot George. I work with Paul. Um, okay. I used to work in publishing, electronic publishing, um, and the government actually uh, spent a lot of money in trying to get this information out and get people to engage with it. But for whatever reason, um, they couldn't get the the, the buy-in from the public to actually start using sites like the Gazette to actually pull information from. Mm. And although they were trying to, I mean, obviously did a poor engagement job, basically. Probably, yeah. They, that, they, were, they were tasked with it, that, you know, the whole idea was to, to make sure that people were actually using this information. But you know, they, they threw money at it and it never really succeeded. The information is there, it's just that people don't know it. Mm -hmm. Right, yes, it seems to be a recurring theme, isn't mm -hmm. it? Any more questions? I think we're going to start getting stuck into the, the beers. There are some soft drinks there as well, by the way. Okay, should we have one more question? Yeah, I've, got, I've got one question. My name's Peter. I, I don't work in IT, but I'm very interested in it. Um, my question to you is, 
you, you had your scale of five stars of open data engagement. Um, what would make a business five stars? Is there any really cool things that you've seen? Yeah, exemplars. It's yeah, exactly. a very good question. It makes them extremely good. At For engagement sharing. generally, or around. No, just a kind of a benchmark you can. Point well, this is what I wanted. Example. This is well, what so I wanted to talk example, about. Yeah. This is an example of the of the having to log into your government profile to get on the Wi-Fi. In Russia. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Are there any no other problem. examples like that that you've seen? I would probably be able to talk more about um, digital engagement and communication in the way of dialogue and two-way conversation. Mm. Something more technical like your example, I don't know, but I would really love to do some research around that. Uh, I can uh, I can uh, easily imagine you know uh, that you would have a you know your unified profile mm. which would give you access to the free internet on buses, mm -hmm. not only in Edinburgh but yep. uh, Brandon, everywhere. Brandon, you're to say something. Oh no, it's not, it's not <laughs> oh, it. just yeah. it. An example of a five-star communication device is yeah. the Edinburgh tram and bus. Yeah, uh, it's yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's it's good. really really good. It's really good. Really good. Really good. The only thing that confused the heck out of me as a kind of uh, a non-native is having uh, on the kind of dot matrix displays the name, sorry, the number of the bus almost not directly next to the number of minutes that the bus is riding. <laughs> and I didn't know whether it was the time or the bus. We yeah. were just glancing at particular <laughs> kind of in a hurry when there were three buses coming in. Mm. I thought that was a UX yeah. issue that needs to be resolved um, at some point. So, yeah. Sally, do you have a question? No, sorry. Anyone else? Well, I, uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. So <laughs> you're, you're so continue. Uh, yeah, the, 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 idea, the idea that you know you could actually kind of rub this kind of engagement which people are not really going into into something useful, which mm. they yeah. want to have, such as the internet. And so, as I said, you know, I clearly uh, work in, yeah. in in Moscow. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Another thing, uh, free internet, uh, one of the projects I worked on was uh, uh, building the wireless access points for project in Aberdeen, which is uh, supplying a community wide free internet access from a community sector. Right. Uh, the council stopped it because it wouldn't allow us to get uh, attached to the lamp post because the lamp posts were individually powered by a switch. Kind of like a jurisdiction or a health and safety issue? No, no, the, 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 the wiring system for the lamp post was it was all powered off at one point. So when you switch them on at night, oh. as a remote switch on. So Sorry, you can actually switch draw power. You can actually draw power from lamp posts because one power during the day. I see. And the process was we were negotiating for our power to be supplied to the lamp posts, but it just fell through because nobody would take the decision in the oh. council to do that type of uh, infrastructure upgrade. Because no one wants to take accountability <coughs> and risk. Yes. That cushy. That, okay. Yeah. And that's not. Go there. <laughs> Is it well, the internet things. Bureaucrats, <laughs> bureaucracy. Ben. Uh, so just one observation really. The two exemplars you gave in your talk were both housing associations. To a certain extent it didn't surprise me too much because of the background and experience housing associations, long history housing associations having collaborative design and code sure. design, which is normally more focused on yeah, the you know, the uh, physical environment of the uh, in the place where people are living and the, and the services around mm -hmm. it so yeah they're, they're being able to transfer those skills and experience into yeah uh, <coughs> into uh, data uh, the digital era is not too surprising and perhaps you know just looking at uh, collaborative design and the yeah. collaborative design yeah Collaborative design, I think that is exactly, you just hit the name, the nail on the head. If you don't have the right design structure in place, mm -hmm. the whole project is doomed to fail. Because ultimately it's about people, not really the technology. Yeah. The technology is a facilitator. And I think particularly, you know, we in the tech industry, we can't sometimes forget about that. You know, we focus on how cool the technology is or how amazing the algorithms are. But ultimately, it's all about solving a problem based around a human need. And I think that if you need to design these things to take that into, into account. So, I, how are you doing for time? Great, you need to rush yeah, off? no, no, it's fine. Any more questions? Don't be shy. No, I just have one more, I mean, there's... Can you say something really controversial? So, it's so, <laughs> uh, <laughs> 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 Well, the, the, the subject that interests me yeah. is uh, 
is metadata. Meta and metadata is the key for actually engagement because mm -hmm. the data about the data where you create some intelligence around uh, what you've got that will actually drive your engagement process. Really. So you've got to have a, a method. It's not just the data itself, it's the metadata that you actually create around it that actually drives that. Now, the whole thing that. about metadata scares me a little bit, actually a lot. It's this issue, of, isn't it, of convenience versus privacy. Because these little devices we carry, carry around are literally, what's the word, spewing out data that should be redacted to the point of being uh, personalized. But something, there was a story that, that broke maybe a week ago, maybe two, either way it was recent, and it really made my blood boil. This is a reputable brand, okay, a trusted app, not some kind of dodgy startup from some obscure country. This is a major a brand, perhaps I shouldn't say, well I am going to say because it's, you know, it's a public fact. Uh, I think it was uh, allegedly, there you go, my fitness pal. Mm -hmm. They had apparently been um, uh, accumulating all this uh, data and just going ahead and sharing the geotag data and they were sharing not only the, the person's location that was using this fitness app, but um, their activity levels and serving them ads based on that information. And they rather, I suppose, they weren't hugely repentant. They just said it's in the, it's in the terms and conditions mm -hmm. that we have ownership of that data in perpetuity. So even if you cancel your account, they still get to support that and, and own that. Now that just, that is completely unacceptable. And all it's going to do is destroy any kind of goodwill or trust between consumers and big companies. Because if the balance is, is, I think, maintained at a point where it's you know, acceptable, you have that nice flow of convenience versus an acceptable level of, of privacy, you have that sort of exchange, that trade of value, and they, they get it right, I think that it'll be a win-win potentially because you'll be able to deliver far more personalized, seamless, delightful, they like using that word, <laughs> services. But the moment they do that, overstep the mark, it just ruins it for everyone. And it's just going to lead to a lot of suspicion, I think. And people are just going to say, I don't want all this stuff in my home. Constantly on, constantly listening. I mean, Alexa is there. It's listening to you, waiting for you to say, you know, hello, Alexa, order a pizza. Same with uh, Google's new product, Google, uh, Google Home. Thank you, exactly. And uh, Apple's uh, equipment, Siri and so on. So constant, we're inviting these devices into our that, that, That's not true, Apple has much more stronger true. standards of not <laughs> sharing. Well, let's just say Apple are falling behind big time and they need to, to raise their game. I mean, Siri has fallen behind in terms of the AI chatbot race. Facebook have M now, it's far more sophisticated. And I think Google probably, I mean, they, they were a bit slow. Amazon came out with Alexa and Echo out of left field, we didn't expect that, but it's highly sophisticated. Watch this space, the talk today is Apple have got a big race on Siri coming, but they've, they've actually made a public point of <laughs> of this issue, right. how much data they mm -hmm. share, the, the, the statements they put out about it. Because their business model is different. You know, Apple make money from selling very high margin products. They're not stupid, yet. <laughs> Correct, so if you're the kind of person who has the budget to pay that margin to buy, I mean, for example, the Apple Watch, I feel it's a flawed product, but then again, the iPhone, the first version of the iPhone was dreadful, they didn't even have 3G, if you remember. So we need to give Apple a little bit of time to, to innovate. But the point is, when you buy Apple products, you are paying full whack for the, the, the product, as yes. opposed Thank to you. Google, who heavily subsidizes the device in order to leverage the data and sell your advertising. It's a completely different model, to the point where I think they'll probably even give away products for free, and the students won't have any option, perhaps, or low to middle income families. And they'll say, well, I can't afford that new state-of-the-art connected domestic appliance. Here goes all my privacy, and they'll install the device for free. But, you know, they don't have the luxury of paying for app products, perhaps. Sorry, just uh, one uh, call, call um, I think the problem is that, that we, the consumer, like our 99 pence applications, and we like our fee applications, and anybody who writes software knows that you can't make a living on the 99 pence application. What people don't realize is they're paying for these applications by giving them data. Of course. You know, that's where the, the company makes a revenue, and yeah. I don't think a lot of people see that. They don't, I, I agree, and, and they will, and there's yeah. going to be, I think, a tipping point, and you will get a situation where 
at some point, yeah, there will, there will suddenly be uh, an issue with, but it's the boiling frog syndrome. By that time, maybe we're so dependent on these devices that it's too late. Now, privacy, it's like Pandora's box, it's gone. And we can never exactly um, pull it back. Can I be controversial say that? Can yeah, go on, The way out of the situation is to watch a couple of films, like uh, The Conversation and Enemy of the State. Yeah, but, uh, you know the film, you know. Yeah, the silver hats. The silver. Very, yeah, very good. Okay, round of applause. Thank you so much. Right, Lisa, I'll just bring the beers to the front. It's going to be a